Thank you, Pierre Tristam. I think in a way to uh, sum up his reality check today was, I have a dream. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am Brian McMillan, and you are listening to Free For All Friday. Welcome. Uh, I'm filling in for David Ayers once again. Next week, he should be back. And I have in the studio Gretchen Smith, communica- Good morning. communications manager for the Department of Health in Flagler County. And Bob Snyder, the illustrious Bob Snyder. <laughs> hey, Brian. Good morning. Uh, Health officer yeah. for the DOH in Flagler. How so, are you? Good, sir. We um, we have a lot of stuff to share this morning and uh, real positive news about vaccines. And and we can give I thought a it was all bad news about vaccines. No, 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 no. No, it's all good news yeah. now. It's all good news. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to be a little more patient. Yes. yes. But- all right. Sounds good. So we'll get to that. We'll talk all things COVID and vaccine. And we also have a guest in the studio today, Joseph Matthews, president of the African American Cultural Society. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Is is this your first time that you have been on the radio? No, it's not. Uh, I appeared uh, on the uh, Pastor Jay show about two and a half, three years ago, I believe, right now. First time on Free For All that I remember, at least. Yes. Very good. Well, um, I'm very happy you could uh, join us today. Today is January 15th, and that is Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Yes, it is. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, observed on Monday, but he would have been 92 years old today. Wow. So you could imagine that he could still be alive. And yeah. that's kind of, re- I, I didn't really think of that as until I was preparing yeah. for the show. You know, you think it's sort of like almost ancient history, you know, Martin Luther King, but um, he, uh, we, we're going to talk about... Uh, we're going to play a few clips from his I Have a Dream speech today. Um, and it's just uh, l- watching it again, listening to it again, it's just so electric, the speech. Um, I'm really excited to talk about it. I think so much of it feels uh, prescient and um, certainly relevant. He was 34 years old when he gave the speech, which again was kind of shocking when I saw that. Wow. Um, and he just, he lived only about five more years before he was assassinated in 1968. Um, again, just quickly to set that up, uh, this, the dream, the speech was given on August 23rd, 1963. Three weeks later, white terrorists bombed the 16th street Baptist church in Birmingham, Alabama. Four little girls were killed. Um, it shocked, shocked everybody, including the segregation of South and it was only three months later, just about to the day that President Kennedy was killed. So this was a really tumultuous time. Uh, I think it's a good reminder that, you know, now is not necessarily unique in uh, American history. Um, sometimes that gives a little perspective, maybe a little bit. Um, we, you know, I hope, I hope it helps us to see that there is maybe uh, a way on the other side, you know, something to, to, to shoot for still, to aim for and strive for. Um, so we will get, we'll get into that. I want to start out with, um, some of the COVID updates and the vaccines. And I don't know if we had Dr. Bickle on the phone. We do. Hello, Dr. Bickle. Hi, good morning. Stephen Bickle, medical director for the DOH and Flagler. Welcome. So, um, let's get into it. Mr. Snyder, okay. what can you tell us about the state of COVID in Flagler? <laughs> Well, we'll do a little reality check here. We won't get into the data too much because I think anyone watching the national news, local news, they know that uh, January has been so far a very rough month when it comes to number of cases, um, uh, admissions to the hospital for COVID, ER visits for COVID-like illnesses. And so we definitely see it in the stats. uh, Total cases to date here in Flagler, 4,633. And when we look at the daily numbers, um, you know, at some days we've doubled and tripled the number of cases uh, from the previous three to four months. It's, you know, November is, was pretty high, then December got worse than January, and then we expect the same in February. But again, don't want to necessarily dwell completely on that other than to say, please, everyone, now is the time. It is a dangerous period, and now is the time to follow public health measures closely, especially the uh, the mask wearing. Can I add, can I uh, just insert one number at least? Sure. Um, the Agency for Healthcare Administration reports today that there are 35 yes. people hospitalized with COVID in in Flagler County in the hospital right now. That is right. Which is three times as many as we saw a few months ago. 
Um, Volusia is also about double what they used to be. There are 161 in Volusia hospitals. That's COVID patients. So it's, mm. um, it's, it's, it's bad. It, it is. And this is the trend, Brian, that we're seeing, you know, statewide in every county. And, of course, it's worse in other states like California and uh, many of the states out west uh, and in the Midwest uh, in New Jersey. But, uh, of course, you know, our focus is here in our community. Um, so we want to jump right into vaccines. So, yes, number one message here, without, uh, without a doubt, is that the demand far exceeds the supply. And that's expected. There's only two companies right now that are manufacturing uh, the vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, we've gotten the Moderna vaccines here in our community. But at some point in time, within the next two to three months, we're going to have a greater supply as each week and each month goes by. We are expecting an allotment next week to arrive Tuesday at the health department. So we'll continue vaccines so at the fairgrounds. Tuesday meaning the 19th? Tuesday oh. the 19th. Okay. That's correct, Brian. And we'll hopefully find out this afternoon, if not this weekend, how many doses that we'll be getting. But the important thing is we have started. Um, so, you know, the number one important uh, element here is, you know, how do you make an appointment? How do you pre-register? Uh, the county emergency management has begun that process about a month ago. So we'll talk about that in greater detail shortly. But the important thing is, is that we got quite a system and operation set up uh, by our Department of Health staff at the fairgrounds with great support from Flagler Volunteer Services and County Emergency Managements for the, you know, the logistic activities. And so we began uh, receiving our first doses on December 28th. And that following day on the 29th, Brian, we began to inoculate uh, first responders, specifically EMS, paramedics, fire rescue, health department staff. We continued that for the next couple of days. Then on January 2nd, we had our large first mass vaccination event at the fairgrounds and within four hours 541 people were given their first dose of Moderna. We really did focus a lot on other healthcare workers. Remember that's the group that takes care of us so we got to keep them safe and keep them healthy. Yeah the, and, I was going to say I assume all those retired nurses who are helping and kind mm -hmm. of like the saviors of the community right now to vaccinate everybody. They've all been vaccinated themselves. Yeah, the majority of them have been vaccinated and including we wanted, you know, to include too, right? Physician doctors office staff, mm -hmm. home health nurses, dialysis nurses, anyone who has direct patient care contact responsibility inches away from the patient. We don't want these folks to catch it, and we don't want them to unwittingly spread it. So that's why this group is so important. No but, one's had the second dose yet, though, right? No, and that'll start in a couple of weeks, and this is an important topic, so we'll get to that as well. So then on January the 4th was our very first day of complete focus and emphasis on those over the age of 65, in addition to uh, healthcare workers. And so we were out there every morning, uh, Monday through Friday of last week. And uh, we pretty much uh, completed all of our first rounds. Uh, 1,700 doses were administered uh, over a uh, about a 10-day period. So we don't have any vaccines right now. We do expect that shipment on Tuesday. That's, now, why, this, that's why you're here today? Because last week you weren't here because you were at the fairgrounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I was, it was like, exactly. bad news that Bob is here because he's not out there with the vaccines. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we. I was. I was on the bike, right, Gretchen? Yes, and, you uh, are. Yeah. So we uh, and we had quite the little army out there, by the way, vaccinating everyone between our staff and volunteers. So next Friday, a week from today, is when we expect our second dose shipment to arrive for that first week of first dose vaccinations. Four weeks will have passed, so the second doses are coming. So each week we'll get a separate allotment earmarked for those who need their second dose. So and we're not turning anyone away. If you received your first dose here in Flagler County and you live in another county, the rule is you can come back here and get that second dose. However, it was clarified yesterday that someone from another country or someone from another state they need to stay in their own state because we've had, especially in the panhandle, we had a lot of folks from Alabama and Georgia 
that wanted to come to Florida to get uh, get their first dose. So I actually got an email about this from somebody saying that they were told that you had to be a Flagler resident to get your second dose, um, but that's not true. But it, I don't know if they were out of state. Maybe that's what they were saying. I don't yeah. know if they drove here from Georgia, but she was mm-hmm. saying, like, I wish I would have known that because... I don't know where she's getting the second dose now. She she can just get it in Georgia. She's from Georgia, I guess. Yep, she can get it in Georgia. That's right, absolutely. Every state is getting uh, an allotment and a shipment. Of course, larger states will get more compared to the uh, smaller populated states. Some people seem a little peeved that we're in Flagler, we're in line, we're trying to get the vaccine, and yet somebody from Tampa can come over and get steal one of our Mm -hmm. vaccines. It's kind of the mentality from some people. Do, have you heard that as well? And what's your thoughts about that? And we, we've heard that, but <laughs> this is the same same playbook and same game plan that is, uh, is really impacting every county, all 67 in the state. Um, if you're a Florida resident, you know, you know, please look at your county, you know, residents operation for the vaccines. But no, we are not to turn anyone away who's over the age of 65 a uh, healthcare worker, and of course, our long-term care facilities are definitely priority. And that includes our snowbirds. That's right. So if mm. you're a snowbird, if you're a snowbird, um, got clarification yesterday, if you're a snowbird and uh, you pay taxes here and you live here a few months out of the year, uh, you're considered to be a Florida resident part-time, and you can get a vaccine here even if you live in another state. And hopefully... People who are moving back and forth in the middle, I guess, what do you do if you got one dose there and then you're back up in Massachusetts or vice versa? Well, you just want to make sure that the same manufacturing company product is being Mm. used. Pfizer to Pfizer, Moderna to Moderna. Right, Gretchen? Exactly. Yeah. So appointments. This is really important. So um, with respect to appointments and registration for doses going forward. Uh, We're going to be uh, participating, as most counties are, in a statewide appointment registration uh, system. It's called ShareCare, and it should be operating in most counties within a month. Uh, So people will be able to uh, make appointments on their own online, or there'll be a phone number that you will call. Uh, So there'll be a phone bank of folks in Tallahassee uh, taking your appointment, helping you to get scheduled no matter what county that you're from. But until then, we encourage all of our Flagler County residents to please uh, go to www.flaglercounty.org, www.flaglercounty.org, and go to the COVID homepage. This is what County Emergency Management has set up. There's a uh, frequently asked question section. But just two key points here. Residents can sign up for COVID-19 text alerts by texting the single word Flagler COVID to the mobile phone number 888-777. You will then get alerts about when the new state registration system is going, or you can call 386-313-4200 Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 p.m., Jonathan Lord has about six to seven individuals who are taking people's calls right now. There's a, a callback list of 4,000 individuals from mm-hmm. Flagler County. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. So these are people wanting that first dose. So, you know, they're on a list here. And so call center staff will call them to let them know when we have supply and inventory to get those first doses in. In addition... People who are ready for their second dose, they will get a call a week ahead of time to say the second doses will be here next week and you are due. So let's set you up with an appointment. Again, so, calling 386 313 4200. So if somebody is listening to this who's 65 up and they want a vaccine, are they like discouraged because they're number 4001 on the list? Well, you know, again, I said earlier, right, and we've all been saying this, that supply has definitely not kept up with demand. I'm going to use the example. We have 36,000 residents over the age of 65 in Flagler County. 
who want the vaccine. And so far, we've received 1,700 doses. Mm -hmm. So just do the math. It's just impossible. But that is going to change because Johnson & Johnson is going to be coming out with a product, hopefully with FDA approval by the end of February. And then AstraZeneca is not too far behind. So at some point in time, we're going to have lots, plenty of supply uh, for the demand. It's just You know, this just right now, that is not the case. And so we're asking folks to please be patient uh, and and, uh, we'll get there. But the important thing is we can do a thousand doses, inoculations a day at the fairgrounds. We have the staff, we have the vaccination teams, the processes have been tweaked, um, improvements have taken place. We got an answer that the statewide appointment scheduling system is coming So that's why I said earlier, it is looking more positive for vaccines other than the fact that, and it is the most important fact, the supply inventory is not there yet, but it is coming. Jonathan Lord also mentioned that he he kind of felt like having a 4,000, you know, then you go to the end of the line, number 4,001, was a bit um, unfair. And so he said that they're actually going to split up the vaccines as they come in. And some of them will be, we're going to tick you down, you know, go down the list of the of the callback list. But then other people can call in fresh once the new vaccines are there, or you can make your online reservation for an appointment. It's not that you can't go and, and try to, you know, to get in that line when they're there. It's just that they want to be called back as soon as it's, it is available. So if you're actually one of the 4,000 and you, you don't know where you are, but you could be number 3,000, you could still call in once you get the text alert saying that they're available and you could possibly still get it sooner. Um, but anyway, so that's a little complicated, but that's what Jonathan, I think that's how Jonathan Lord explained it. To exactly. Me. I was going to bring that up. Okay. The other thing too, is that Publix is getting it now. Yes. So that's another option for people. And um, we're, we understand that each of the four Publix here are supposed to get 300, what, 300, a, 300 week. a week. Yeah, so all four publics, and I believe there's an 800 number that you can call. I know it was uh, the number appeared, uh, Brian, I think, in your paper in Palm Coast yeah, Observer. We have, a, we have a story on our website right now about the Good. vaccines mm-hmm. at Publix, so you can search for that and get and, more and details. You, and you can click on the Publix link at the www.flagdercounty.org, um, the COVID homepage mm-hmm. as well. So. Uh, that is just a great homepage, and of course, on our website too. Right, we, have we the updated same. our website. Okay, so um, <laughs> Dr. Bickle, I think it's really important though that uh, I know that I've fielded a ton of calls. I think I I talked to pretty much everyone over the age of sixty five who got their first dose um, over the past week about um, <laughs> about how Moderna. Um, you know how after you get your first dose, you're you're in pretty good shape, and you just have to wait to get that second dose. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, the the data is the most uh, robust for the whole study, which was two doses and looking at, you know, the two months after that. But there's actually some data because, you know, the the people who got the first shot, then they waited four four weeks for the second shot, and they tracked cases during that time. And they found that starting at 14 days after the first shot, there were almost no cases um, before the, even before the second shot. So that there was actually, I think, two out of a thousand um, patients who were followed in that period. So, and that's true actually with booster vaccines in general. Is that usually there's a, a level of protection with the first, and then you get a kind of turbocharged with the second, um, in, uh, the second dose. And then it turned out in the numbers that the statistics they did that the effectiveness in that small group with limited data was 92 percent versus the 94 in the in the full trial so it was very comparable and most most vaccinologists think that there's there's usually a window from like one to three maybe even six up to six months where boosters are very effective and 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 so the what the reason the trials were done this way was because they wanted to get these vaccines um, approved as quickly as possible and they knew that they had to wait at least three weeks between doses to, for the booster to work, but they, they didn't want to ch- take it out longer. It's entirely possible that the studies may be done later in the year or, um, and, and like using a two, two-month two booster um, interval. So people should feel pretty confident. There's We don't have that much data on these particular vaccines, but in general, um, 
there's some protection for probably at least three months and, 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 a, and a window to get the second dose probably at least that long. Very good. Um, if you are just joining us, um, first of all, you know, you got to set your alarm so you never miss the beginning of the show ever again. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you're just joining us, I want to reintroduce, you're listening to Free For All Friday on WNZF. I'm Brian McMillan, editor of the Palm Coast Observer Filling in for David Ayers, we have Gretchen Smith, communications manager for the Department of Health in Flagler. We have Bob Snyder, the health officer for the DOH in Flagler, Dr. Bickle, medical director, and uh, Joe Matthews, president of the African American Cultural Society. We're going to talk um, about Martin Luther King today also um, in the second half of the show. Um, and But I wanted to ask you, Joe, are you over 65? Am I over 65? Yes. No, yes, you, I, don't, you don't look yes, a day I, over 49. Yes, Joe. I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Have Matter you gotten a vaccine? No, I haven't. Uh, my wife and I, we've been trying to uh, schedule uh, mm-hmm. appointments to, uh, to get the vaccine. What has happened is uh, every time we get information on uh, the availability of, uh, of making appointments, we uh, we try and uh, all the appointments are gone. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the latest was uh, just the uh, couple of days ago when it was announced that Publix was offering. Uh, my wife tried to uh, try to uh, schedule an appointment, and by the time she was she had gotten through, all of the appointments were gone. I have some friends who are uh, acquaintances that. Uh, were able to go to Publix in person and huh. schedule appointments, hmm. and they're getting their shots. I have uh, uh, friends uh, that are getting their shots on uh, Sunday and some on Monday. So yeah. uh, I'm sure your experience is not unusual. No. As, right. as uh, mm-hmm. Bob was saying, 36,000 residents over over 65 in Flagler yeah. County. Um, but uh, so, do, are you feeling kind of frustrated? Nervous? Are you being um, patient? Bob's saying, "Be patient." Well, we're going to be patient. We are. We are feeling uh, a little bit uh, frustrated by it. Sure. Mm-hmm. But to uh, initially answer your question, if I'm over sixty-five, yes, I am. Matter of fact, on the seventeenth of February, I will be uh, seventy-eight. Congratulations! So, uh, so I'm yeah. over. I'm over sixty-five, <laughs> and uh, so so I'm uh, I'm in that age group yeah. that's uh, eligible to get the shot. Very you good. know, you know, it's great. Yesterday, I got uh, an email from um, uh, Mount Calvary Baptist, mm-hmm. and they volunteered. They said we want to be a vaccination site, and I said, "Gosh, I wish we had enough vaccine that we could, you know." make you a vaccination site because they did such a great job and they were such a great partner when we were um, doing testing there. And so, so it it was great that uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa stepped up and said, we want to be a vaccination site when it comes to that point. So is that, is, are we going to get to that point where different churches Mm -hmm. have vaccines or I mean, 10, 10 different sites around Flagler? We will. Um, So our goal, uh, Truly, it's a short-term goal, I mean, right around the corner. The goal is to have four separate vaccination teams um, of nurses and support staff. Uh, Two teams would be a morning and an afternoon team, uh, given shots, uh, 500 shots in the morning, 500 in the afternoon at the fairgrounds, refer to that as our fixed site. And then as more supply and inventory comes in, uh, we'll have uh, two other vaccination teams that will go out and about in the community uh, to, uh, to go to churches, just like we do with community mm-hmm. testing. We had Grace Presbyterian, Mother Ann Seton, Santa Maria del Mar, Bapt- uh, Benel Baptist Church, United Methodist. So we'll go to all these churches. We'll go to uh, f- uh, fixed sites and neighborhoods and like the community of Benel or, or the, even – you know, the hammock, uh, uh, any zip code area uh, where we have maybe a, a just slightly larger population and, and we're going to be borrowing the school district's uh, mobile classroom. It's a bus that will turn into a command center. And, you know, so, yes, I can envision these two mobile teams going out and about, fanning uh, throughout the community uh, to set up vaccination clinics, either drive through sites or, you know, safe vaccination sites indoors somewhere so but that will all happen when we have this inventory of supply to give Mm -hmm. out 
I read on the uh, th- um, there's a new service of Florida story that pointed out there's a little pattern in the publixes that are getting the vaccines seem to be in mostly Republican counties. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> well, there are <laughs> that um, there are 70 Publix uh, by Monday next week that will have vaccines to give out um, in terms of how they were chosen. Not quite sure, other than I did hear on a conference call that they wanted to choose Publix in like more rural areas. Mm. And so I think that is yeah, true. <laughs> that makes sense. I'm not trying to sow the seeds of, you know, political <laughs> divisiveness. Um, so um, what else do we need to know about the about the vaccines before we maybe take a break and go go into the next section here? Uh, Dr. Bickle, we're going to turn to you, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> what are like the, like the top two talking points uh, that you'd like to highlight regarding whether the efficacy of the vaccine or just what you see coming down the next two to three months? Well, I first saw, I think, just to reiterate, the vaccines are extremely effective and so far look very safe. There's a slight increase in the in uh, numbers of severe allergic reactions, which are treatable, but it's still very a rare phenomenon. The other thing is there is a, we're going to kind of go from rags to riches. Um, there's a lot of vaccine that's going to be produced by, by the end of, by, uh, the, by like midsummer. Um, Moderna's schedule, I think, is for 200 million doses and Pfizer's 170 million. So that's that you know if you'd have that's 370 million that's just for the U.S. 370 million divided by 285 million for uh, people could be vaccinated with two doses. Um, so that's a, that's going to be a good chunk of the population. Um, so that's one bit of good news. Like you know we're getting ready to transition from sort of rationing and having just one site to be going out going out mobily so we can get as many people in the county vaccinated as possible to try to get to community immunity. And I think the other point I want to make is that people should realize that we are in the height of this pandemic right yes. now. And yes. the odds of getting infected are directly proportional to how many people out there that you might run into have the infection. And this is the highest it's ever been. So the last thing you want to do is get infected, especially a severe infection, you know, the month before you're scheduled to get vaccinated. So people, please be vigilant. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's been talked about before, but, you know, if we compare what we were feeling like, you know, nine months ago or so, um, you know, we got to have a mask mandate. We got to lock everything down. And now the numbers are totally going northeast on the chart. And um, there's a lot less talk of that. So I do think that it's important that we keep, you know, we got to wash our hands. <laughs> 20 <laughs> seconds. Right. We got to keep your mask on whenever possible and stay six feet away. So I think <laughs> yeah. that we just, we just have to be vigilant with it and um, not wait around for the vaccine. You know, Brian, and another important point, and I'd like Dr. Bickle to speak about this, yeah, so, you know, so some of us are, are healthcare workers and we've gotten the vaccine, but it's still very important uh, for us as those that got our first dose and then our second is we still need to be careful because we can still carry the virus in our nasal passages and pass it on to others, right, Dr. B? So we're protected um, because we got the vaccine, but we still have to be vigilant in protecting our neighbors and loved ones. Yes, we, we don't know the extent to which the vaccines are pre- going to prevent infection. So until these, I mean, it looks like they do to some degree, but not probably to the degree that they prevent disease, which means symptomatic COVID. Um, and, you know, until these numbers start really coming down, people should remain just hi- hyper vigilant. That's, that's the key here. Um, you know, we'll start, and we'll start seeing, I think the first thing we should see from these vaccines, which could happen fairly soon, is that the, the hospitalization rates and the death rates are going to start dropping because the most vulnerable people who end up in the hospital and dying are going to be you know, getting vaccinated. But to get to the general community and get the case numbers down, it's going to take a little longer. But until then, it, it, it's like Brian said, that there's this kind of disconnect between how bad it is out there and how much people perceive it to be bad out there. And they're kind of like in, in the last spring, we were all, 
you know, paranoid about it, but there weren't actually that many cases. And now people are getting more desensitized to it, but there's just a ton of cases. So, yeah. you know, just keep keep that in mind, people, and, and don't be... Um, you don't be a victim to this before you can get vaccinated. And, and, and just, a a, just a word, Brian, about resources. So we're going to get to the point, everyone, real, real soon, where we'll be starting to transition from taking staff members and resources that are currently doing community testing and contact tracing and move these individuals over to the vaccination program and administration phase because at some point in time, I mean, with the supplies expected to come in greater numbers and quantities, we're, we're going to want to totally uh, focus on and emphasize uh, getting these vaccines out ASAP, you know, into our arms. And so that and in that point in time, uh, community testing will probably just take place for where there's breakouts, where we have many spreading kind of events that need to be investigated and a lot of people need to be contacted. Um, you know, so we'll community test those individuals and contact trace those individuals. But at some point, a big transition will take place from those kinds of epidemiological activities to a total 100% uh, focus on, on vaccinations. Very good. Um, so we have our update on vaccines. You're listening to Free For All Friday. Today, January 15th, is Martin Luther King's birthday. So uh, when we come back, um, I'm looking at Mark Gilliland, our producer, does an amazing job as always. Thank you, Mark. Um, so when we come back, we will talk about Martin Luther King and his, his immortal speech um, at... Um, from Washington, D.C. in 1963. If you haven't heard the speech in a while or ever, um, you're going to want to listen to these few clips that we have because uh, they're um, very inspiring. Uh, so stick with us. Welcome to H&R Black. Uh, I got to get these taxes done. I just need to know how much I'm going to get back and when. Well, I'm not really sure. Not sure? I'm kind of new at this tax thing. New? How much is this going to cost me? Well, would three or four hundred be okay? Jeez. What does H&R stand for anyway? Uh, how do you spell that? Thanks anyway. I'm going to Flagler Tax Service. Flagler Tax Service. Call 793-7156. I probably shouldn't be saying this, but your neighbor came in the other day. And he's got money under his mattress. That Smarter Smart Bed is the way to go. It adjusts to what you want, from rock hard to cuddly soft. And it doesn't cost a fortune. Never pay retail. Put your money under your mattress. Stop in and try the Smarter Smart Bed. The beds are smarter than we are. You know who we are. We're Bed Tops Mattress Clearance Center in Palm Coast. Call us anytime. 386-627-4188. Bed Tops Mattress Clearance Center. So you're ready to list it? We're ready to sell it. This is Sam Perkovich, broker owner of Parkside Realty Group. Stop by our office in Town Center or call us at 302-0300. Visit us online at parksiderealtygroup.net. My whole business just went up in flames, but my agent was there before the fire was out. We started a plan. I've got 25 employees who could be out of a job get this place running again. My independent agent and auto owner's insurance, they made sure we didn't skip a beat. I mean, we didn't miss a single payroll. That's incredible. For whatever lies ahead, we're always there. In Flagler County, call the Haywood Brown Flagler Insurance Agency at 437-7767. Welcome back to Free For All Friday. <clears throat> we are celebrating the 92nd birthday of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I have in the studio with me Gretchen Smith, communications manager for the DOH in Flagler. Good morning. I have Bob Snyder, the health officer for the DOH in Flagler. Glad to be here, Brian. How old were you in 1963, Bob? Oh, gosh, I was nine years old. Nine years old. Yes. My dad was born in 53, so he was, I think he might have been 10 at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit young to remember the actual speech, but... Um, Joe Matthews was a little bit older. Do you remember uh, hearing about the speech? I assume you weren't there exactly, but this was August 28th. He corrected me uh, off the air. I said 23rd. That's what an article I read, but now that I'm looking at it, 
some more sources I I concur. August 28th, correction. Joe Matthews, president of the African American Cultural Society. What what do you remember about this speech? Did it seem famous at the time? I mean, it's kind of hard to go back in history and say, this is going to be remembered forever. Yes, it was. Uh, it was very much um, uh, an inspiring uh, speech and uh, one that was uh, very, very much needed at the time. Uh, in 1963, I was, uh, well, I graduated from high school in 61 at 18. So I was 20 years old in 1963. And uh, I remember uh, that uh, at that time, there were a lot of marches and things going on to basically uh, move, uh, move the, uh, the African-American uh, movement forward. And it was done basically with churches and ministers. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther King led that march. Uh, his whole uh, approach was nonviolent. And uh, when, uh, when we had marches or when their, their marches were conducted, uh, they were peaceful. And, um, and, but uh, with the tender of the, of the times, uh, they weren't well accepted. And so there were violent uh, protests against the uh, nonviolent protests that um, Martin Luther King wanted to uh, lead. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so he felt that the movement should come from the religious uh, community, which means the churches. So a lot of his, uh, his lieutenants, the people that were on his, uh, that were part of his executive staff were, were ministers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were um, going out to their respective uh, churches and communities to uh, to spread the nonviolent. Yeah, a lot of uh, his protests. speeches, they did use a lot of this, uh, is very resonant with biblical language. And, you know, as a reverend, um, you yes. know, he was definitely preaching uh, in some ways with, with these speeches. Let's hear, let's hear a clip. This, yes. is the, this is toward the very beginning of the speech. It's about a minute and 10 seconds or so. Um, but you can kind of uh, get a get a feel for what what that day was like in 1963. And so we've come here today to dramatize the shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. So what I, what I hear there is somebody who believes in America. This is a patriot. Um, the magnificent words of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, but yet there is a problem that has to be confronted. And um, in, you know, after President Kennedy was, was, was killed, um, Lyndon Johnson um, pushed through and, and really advocated for um, was largely responsible for the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act in 1965, which did um, w w was a major victory. You know, uh, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but do you feel Joe Matthews, president of the AACS, African American Cultural Society, do you feel like this bad check is still if the the check is still bad? How are there still insufficient funds as? Dr. King said. 
Yes, it is. And uh, you can you can see what's happening even today uh, with the uh, impeachment of the president, uh, the rioting, uh, the storming of the uh, Capitol, the uh, the uh, trying to take away the democracy of, uh, of our government. This is all uh, systemic uh, racism and to uh, eliminate or try to eliminate the, uh, the, the population and the, the, uh, the, the uh, well, I'm getting very compassionate about this. <laughs> Um, That's why you're here. Yeah, Go on. Yes. Let's hear it. That, what do you, what, that, I want to know what you have to say. That um, that our voices are are trying to be silenced. Uh, I think that um, we as a people, and I'm talking about all people, but mainly uh, African Americans, uh, we feel that we have not been dealt a good uh, uh, opportunity to. Uh, be part of the citizenry of uh, of the United States. We uh, we are, uh, are denied uh, the right to vote, and uh, and I try to tell people that voting is extremely important. And if it wasn't, why would they try to com- uh, depress it uh, to prevent us from voting? So we have to have a voice. But that's what. Um, <clears throat> What we are trying to, uh, and Martin Luther King talked about this in 63, that we are citizens, we should have a voice, and that um, we should be able to, um, to do the, uh, what, what other Americans uh, yeah. can do. Sharon Austin is a professor of political science at the <clears throat> University of Florida, and she wrote an article um, almost a year ago, exactly today, um, where she points out that um, there are w- one way you can see that things have gotten better is that there are more people in positions of power, elected officials. We've had a black president, so these are all good things. But there's a lot of battles that are still being fought that are not a whole lot better. For example, um, Dr. King had was very passionate about economic opportunity for African Americans and. Um, Sharon Austin says that in 1968, 32% of blacks were in poverty. Today, 21% are in poverty, which is somewhat better, but still horrible. And we, we can see there's a lot of work to be done. 21% is three times that of, of what, the white poverty rate. She also pointed out this really troubling step about black social progress or the lack thereof the number of black families headed by single women. In the 1960s, unmarried women were the main breadwinners for 20% of households. In recent years, the percentage has risen as high as 72%. And that to me is really, um, you know, a heartbreaking reality. And you think about what impact that has on the household, the children. Um, and what what that says for what is the what are the opportunities for the next generation? Um, also, uh, not enough can be said about what kind of struggle and bravery and amount the amazing work that is being done by those single women to lead those households, despite you know a lot of hardship. Um, let's go to another clip. This one's shorter. It's about eighteen seconds. Nineteen sixty three is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hoped that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. Business as usual. 1968 to ni- 1965 to 68, there were 150 race riots. Two years after the, you know, in that period after this. Um, so today we're, we're seeing more of it. Um, so my question is, it it sounds, um, can we have peace and change at the same time? Yes, we can. Um, let me talk about violence. Uh, uh, we've had, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, African American, uh, 
individuals, men and women, that have been uh, brutally uh, murdered uh, by policemen, mainly, and um, by other citizens uh, talking about the uh, the uh, killing in Georgia of a uh, uh, Aubrey uh, individual. Um, we have, uh, through the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, it's been a peaceful, nonviolent type movement. The uh, uprising and the rioting that took place during those movements is uh, has been uh, infiltrated by individuals that want to give the movement a a negative uh, light that uh, people are upset and there has been uh, there has been some uh, rioting and looting but that's isolated the majority of the individuals that participate in the movement uh, in black lives matter is a movement it's not a uh, it's not a parade or, or anything of that matter. It is a movement, and it's a movement to move uh, black lives forward and to give individuals, to give people uh, that black lives does matter just like any other life. If, if black lives uh, doesn't matter, then no lives matter. Mm -hmm. So that movement is to uh, put the... Uh, emphasis up front that we are just as much uh, important to this country as anyone else, and we want to be treated as such. Dr. King also said um, <clears throat> that not to, you know, distrust white people. This is what he's telling the crowd there, because some have re have realized that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. He said, they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And I think that that's what I hope, if there's one takeaway here, you know, if uh, freedom um, and oppression, or oppression for some means that America has, has a, a mark on it. And if we want America to be the best that we can, then we need everybody to have the same kind of opportunities. Exactly. Um, exactly. Let's go to the last <clears throat> clip here. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, really. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's this immortal moment in, in American history where to me, a leader, a true leader, um, not just pointing out, you know, this is horrible. That's horrible, which there's plenty to talk about there, but that's not enough. That's not true leadership. Anybody can point out a problem. The point is, can you give us a vision for the, for, to go forward? Can you give us a dream that we can strive to? And I think that that is what, um, why, you know, this is, this is regarded as one of, you know, the greatest speeches of all time, you know, in human history. Um, I read a lot about it, you know, preparing for this. Um, and I just think, can you kind of leave us, Joe Matthews, president of the African American Cultural Society, um, with what do you feel like is the dream that we can be striving toward you know, how can we make today a little bit better than, t than yesterday? 
I think the where it starts is with the uh, attitudes of uh, of individuals um, to look at an African American not as a um, someone that's beneath you, but someone that's just as equal as you are. Um, and the thing is, we have uh, leaders. We have individuals that are educated, that uh, that are uh, making contributions to society. But in the final analysis, when you look at them, they're a black individual, and a lot of people look at blacks as if they're inferior. Uh, we have the same wants, desires. We we just want to be able to. Uh, be given the, the, the same opportunities that everybody else is given and not look at us as uh, by the color of our skin, but consider us uh, citizens, just like the average, uh, the average mm-hmm. Joe on the street, if I can use that expression. Well, those are very uh, powerful words. Um, I appreciate you joining us. And, and I appreciate you uh, asking me to, uh, to come. Absolutely. Um, we should not forget about the march that's happening tomorrow, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, it's going to be a motorized march starting from the, uh, the Culver Gym in, uh, in Bunnell. And that gym is located at uh, 201 East Drain Street. That's uh, D-R-A-I-N Drain Street at uh, 10 a.m., which uh, when the parade will uh, start off, we will be staging starting at 8.30, and uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, It's going to be a motorized march, so it's going to be in your cars. No one is going to be walking. Mm -hmm. Uh, We will uh, do a short route around uh, Bunnell. Uh, we're, We're starting at the center, of course, and uh, looping around on US-1 to uh, Moody Boulevard and back to the Culver Gym. We're gonna do that loop because it's a short route. We'll be doing that loop twice. And uh, so if you are available, nothing to do, come out and, uh, and join the, uh, the parade. We'll be glad to, uh, to have you. Good. So again, tomorrow at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. The parade. Um, I'm going to finish off with the words of John Lewis, the U.S. rep. Yes. He died last year. He said about Martin Luther King, by speaking the way he did, he educated, he inspired, he informed, not just the people there, but people throughout America and unborn generations. And um, I was born 17 years later <laughs> after this speech, but it certainly has really inspired me. I, I listened to a bunch of speeches uh, one year and um, just, uh, it just, it's, it's righteous, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he's drawing on these biblical phrases and yes. they are perfectly applicable because he's painting this dream that is, um, it's good, it's pure goodness. Yes. So I appreciate yes. again, everyone for joining us. Thank you for uh, listening to Free For All Friday and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye.